What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. I hope you're having a wonderful holiday season and getting ready for the new year and I'm very excited for one for 2024. Got a lot of cool things planned. Today's video though is a special one for me that I look forward to every single year. This is our year in review. If this is your first year in review video you've watched on the channel, what I'm gonna do here basically is summarize the year, hit up the high points, what was the cool stuff we did this year. I'll talk about the top three brews that I made and the bottom three brews that I made. Uh, talk kind of quickly about what the plans are for next year as well. I really enjoy taking this time to reflect and look at what an awesome year 2023 was. Uh, we saw some really, really great growth in the channel. I explored some really cool concepts and ideas, and um, I'm really excited to see what 2024 has to offer because we're not stopping anytime soon. As is tradition during this video, I've got some aged beer from uh, earlier in the year. This is the Double, one of the last bottles I have of that. Uh, the Belgian Double that I party guiled. But first, let's go ahead, wrap up, and summarize the year. This year was pretty wild. Um, not only did I have some pretty incredible personal stuff happen in my life, which we'll get to later, uh, but also I traveled to a ton more places than I usually do. I did a bunch more collaborations this year. I amassed a lot more equipment, and I brewed some really interesting beers that I've never brewed before. There was a ton of production improvement, I think, this year as well, uh, which is always a good thing to see kind of steadily improving year to year. As far as the numbers go, we started off on January 1st with 22,000. 960 subscribers and I am absolutely pumped to see 10,000 more subscribers this year. As of today, as of right now, um, I have 32,503 subscribers. So I'm incredibly, incredibly happy that the channel has seen so much growth and that people are still coming in and finding value in it. This sort of thing makes me very, very happy. Um, and I love to see the channel continuing to grow because I am putting a lot of work into it and it makes me happy that people are finding it and enjoying what they see here. Year over year, this is actually a higher increase in subscribers than we had last year, so that's actually really cool. As far as videos go, I made 44 videos this year, that includes this one, and 23 of those were grain to glass brews. That number is pretty much the same as it was last year, so despite taking a few breaks this year in production, I'm happy to see that I was able to continue on with that that tempo and that cycle. Within those 23 beers, it's time to talk now about my favorite three. So coming into the third place spot, I have my Robust Porter. My Robust Porter, I submitted it to the National Homebrew Competition this year, uh, and it actually won a silver mini best of show in the local first round of the competition, so that was awesome. Uh, did not win any medals at the national level, but still, it made it past that first round, so I'm pretty proud of that. It was a really good beer, a nice, delicious, I think classic example of an American porter uh, just has a nice it had a nice alcohol kick to it it had a pretty aggressive roastiness uh, the only thing missing from it I think was just a little bit um, of an increased uh, bitterness I think there needed to be more hop presence and more hop bitterness in it when I brewed that beer is actually the first porter I'd made in something like three years so it was actually really nice to have a, a really good example of a porter on tap for the time that it was on tap I really enjoyed it coming in at the number two slot we have the treehouse IPA for for the amount of time that it has been published, this is my most popular recipe uh, in terms of views and in terms of people getting back to me and saying that they brewed it. Um, so this beer was inspired by the uh, guidance that Nate Lanier from Treehouse Brewing put out earlier in the year when they started their uh, awesome YouTube channel. He's continued to put out some great content, but it's not all been homebrew related. That one was, and so he gave us most of the pieces of the puzzle, but didn't fill us in on a few things like water profile and that that sort of thing. So I took that guidance and then built a recipe around it um, to then build this amazing hazy IPA. And uh, hands down, that was the best hazy IPA I've ever made. The hops worked together beautifully, the grist was dialed in perfectly, and the water profile made it so soft and pillowy and uh, really made the hops very, very juicy. Um, the balance of the beer was fantastic as well, and that keg did not last long at all. And then finally, the number one beer for the year was my double decoction mass Czech Dark Lager that I did not too long ago now. Um, that beer is henceforth completely gone. This beer took a really, really long time to make, but man, it was worth every second. Um, the double decoction mash added tons of character to the beer, and it was just such a fun process to be involved in making the beer in such a uh, traditional and historical way. And then going through the process of actually doing a traditional lager on it, a long-term cold storage period 
did, letting it naturally clarify. It had that beer feeling so beautifully clean. Uh, that lager was one of the best, if not the best, lager that I've ever made in my entire brewing career. A couple that was serving it out of a Lucre faucet, and it had that beautiful, soft, semi-sweet chocolate character to it. Uh, not really roasty at all, but just beautiful in its flavors and in just the way that it came through. It was such an incredible beer and one that I really wish I'd made 10, 15, 20 gallons of, um, and five was not enough. Just unbelievable, I was so happy with it. Now let's talk about the bottom three, my three least favorite beers this year. Um, and I will preface this by saying that I don't think any of these three beers were bad. This year was actually pretty nice in that I didn't make a batch that was objectively bad um, or that I just really would not recommend brewing. Just out of the 23 beers, these are the ones that I had to really say, okay, these are not my favorites. So uh, coming in the third for the bottom spot, I have the 100% Britannomyces Saison that I made. Um, um, this was a really fun experiment, and I really enjoyed making it. Uh, however, the way the Brett character developed over time started to get kind of tough to drink. Um, so it was initially very pineapple-y and very fruity and just had a little bit of that horse, uh, that barnyard funk kind of thing. But at the same time, it would obviously continue to evolve and develop over time because it's Brett. Brett is an organism that does not do things on a very fast timeline, uh, but if you let it sit long enough, it will evolve in flavor, and that's what happened with the Brett Saison. I was actually going to save some of it for this particular video, um, but because of how poorly it actually ended up aging, I did not. I did eventually drink through the whole thing, but towards the end, it just started tasting like feet, um, and it was incredibly phenolic in a way that was just like way too over the top. The balance is on the interesting character that I initially had when the beer was a bit younger was gone and unfortunately um, just because of that fact it ended up at the third for the bottom spot. Second from the bottom, I have the Graph. This was a really fun experiment. Again, a new style, uh, and it was a collaboration with Trent from the Brew Show. And I had a great time making a graph uh, and using that random wheel of beer styles uh, to choose the base beer for it, which ended up being an old ale. The issue that I had with the Graph is just that the flavors of the old ale and the apple juice um, did not work really very well together. The kind of acidic character of the apple juice did not blend very well with the rich toffee maltiness of the old ale and I thought it was gonna work, but it really didn't. Um, I let the beer age for a really long time though, and it has since gotten better. Uh, I actually still have some of it left, um, and I'm not gonna taste it for this video because I just don't like it really, but it has gotten better over time. Uh, however, in the initial time when we tasted that beer, it was a little rough, <laughs> and uh, not one that I necessarily think I would be making again, at least in the same proportions. I think it would definitely be improved by maybe making it four parts wort and one part apple juice instead of 50-50. And then for the beer that I actually disliked the most out of the year, I have my Raspberry Berliner Weiss. I kettle soured this beer and it got really sour. Um, I, I think I ended up getting it down below 3.1 uh, for the pH of the beer, which is, that's it's really, really sour. Um, and I did not back sweeten it. Hey, it served its purpose. It was absolutely a drinkable beer, um, but I personally am just not a big fan of sour beers. I'll drink them on occasion, but it's not something I necessarily enjoyed having five gallons of. And as it sat, it got more and more sour. And by the time I was at the very end of that keg, it was really difficult to drink. It was giving me acid reflux, um, and it was just not a pleasant experience anymore. Um, uh, though those people that love sour beers that came over to my house to have beers really enjoyed it, and they, I think, are responsible for drinking most of it. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, just my least favorite of them all. Still, I think, a good example of a fruited Berliner Weiss, but um, just not one that I would necessarily make, I think, again, for my own personal drinking. All right, I think it's now time for us to taste some aged beer. Uh, so this is one of the last three bottles I have, large bottles, of uh, my Belgian Double that I party guiled with a table beer back in April. It's been sitting in the basement for a while and it's got some nice dust on it. Um, but I'm excited to see if it's gotten any better. When I packaged this, I think I ended up introducing some oxygen, unfortunately, because when I taste this periodically over the last eight months or so, it has, Got some noticeable oxidation character, unfortunately. So 
That's probably gonna be the case here, but I still wanted to share it with you guys because it is still fun. It was a really fun brew to make. I'd never done a party gal before, and um, I honestly had a really, really wonderful time doing it. A uh, great way to get two beers for the price of one, slightly longer brew day out of it, but um, man, it was awesome. But anyway, enough babbling. Let's go ahead and pop this bad boy open. For appearance, it's nice, very, uh, very clear, uh, kind of dark ruby red, a little bit of brown tints to it. Head fades kind of quickly. I think that's, again, oxidation being an issue. Yeah, it's still oxidized. I think every single bottle's gonna be oxidized. It's got that really strong kind of cola flavor, um, which is a pretty clear indicator. Really uh, reduced malt flavor, reduced, um, depth of character in in that unfortunately i mean it doesn't taste awful i mean this is one of those beers that oxidation isn't too unfriendly to but um the flavor i remember be just being so much more there's a little bit of yeast character left definitely getting some of the uh original notes of dark bread and uh raisin um and then there's a little bit of a dr pepper note in there because it's oxidized could be worse but still not a terrible beer the yeast character is still present i'm getting a decent amount of pear the classic Belgian spiciness, unfortunately, is kind of subdued and the beer is tasting pretty sweet um, because it's got that kind of cola note. It's still perfectly drinkable, but it's like a 5 out of 10 in terms of flavor, you know what I mean? So that's kind of sad, but honestly, that's what I was expecting. I wish I had done a better job of keeping other beers on standby for this particular video. I just feel like every year I do something like this and I try to plan forward to taste aged beers on the video and I just end up grabbing whatever I have left in the basement. It's not always the best example of what I can do, but <laughs> what are you gonna do? Nevertheless though, let's carry on because now I'm gonna talk about all of the equipment changes that have taken place over the last year. I only got rid of one thing and uh, that was my Anton Par Easy Dents and I accidentally broke it. That's why I got rid of it. Um, there's a very fragile little tube on the inside of it and one day while I was brewing it slipped out of my hands, hit the hard concrete floor in my basement and uh, his sense forth died. However, I took this opportunity to go ahead and actually get an Anton Par Smart Ref, which is pretty much the same concept as the Easy Dents, just half the price, um, and still works the same way with the same app. It's a digital refractometer that does automatic uh, work alcohol correction and work color correction, and it works just as good as the Easy Dents does, in my opinion. And again, it's half the price and is a lot easier to clean, and it's a lot more uh, robust. So I use the uh, Smart Ref pretty much exclusively now for all of my gravity measurements. Because of this though, you're still seeing the same fermentation plots uh, in every video. It's the same app as the Easy Dance had. It was, however, a very big year in terms of stuff that was gained. Uh, not just that I get the Smart Ref, but there really was a lot of heavy, large equipment that uh, entered my brewery. So firstly, the Blickman Brew Easy Compact Surface. Uh, it was a recent acquisition. I've been brewing kind of like almost every other batch with that because I enjoy the system and it works pretty well. Just more geared towards a low gravity kind of beer. Um, it can't really brew high gravity beers, but man, the Brew Commander is an incredible thing and can step mash like nothing else I've ever seen. Um, so it's a really cool system. It's got a lot of cool accessories that I really enjoy using. Secondly, I got the Brewbuilt X2 jacketed conical fermenter the earlier this year and holy crap that thing's been amazing not just is it amazing for cold crashing and temperature control in general uh, but that jacket is such a powerful chilling device that i can get my wort to go down from about 100 degrees to a pitching temperature in a few hours right after a brew day just with a jacket um, i wouldn't recommend cooling your entire batch that way because it does put a lot of stress on whatever you're using to chill uh the glycol or water or whatever you have in the jacket um, but it's definitely doable for like a 30 degree drop because in the summer my water does not really chill the batch down very effectively so I'm left with about a 90 to 100 degree wort uh, really when it goes in the fermenter but that jacket takes care of that problem pretty quick uh, so I've really enjoyed that and in kind of auxiliary to that I did get a brew built ice master max 2 glycol chiller um, which was part of the whole deal with the x2 that's not the world's best glycol chiller but it's certainly the most affordable one for home brewers relatively speaking uh, these things are not cheap 
cheap, but it works really well for the single fermenter and um, I have not had any issues with it thus far. I also ended up installing a Buckeye Hydro reverse osmosis system, uh, and that has been a game changer for water. Uh, just being able to not have to go to the store anymore and buy expensive spring water uh, or expensive distilled water, and just being able to get relatively neutral and very, very soft reverse osmosis water as a base to start brewing from uh, means that everyone else can also get more reliable water chemistry when they follow my recipes because they know I'm building off of a pretty much neutral source again. Um, I got a lot of comments that were negative in terms of uh, me using the spring water and I think that's fair because it means different things around the world. So going back to clean, soft, basically zero parts per million brewing water is certainly something that I think has a lot of value for everyone who's watching my channel. So I hope you really enjoyed that. I certainly have enjoyed having that system in my basement. I had to replace my kegerator um, because the new air kegerator that I've had for a couple years uh, was having some thermostat issues and in my attempt to uh, replace the thermostat or, or service the thermostat, I ended up actually accidentally cracking a refrigerant line and thus rendering the entire kegerator defunct. Uh, so I had to replace it and I'm very happy I did because I went with a Comos kegerator which can actually fit four corny kegs in it instead of three. It's just so much easier to manage the four kegs in it than it was before so I'm um, very happy to have that. Many of you also follow Glowhammer Supply and I'm sure that you are uh, tracking their keg fermenter saga. I also have one of their prototype keg fermenters, uh, so I've enjoyed using that a few times every so often. Um, it was very, very useful for fermenting my Brett beer in because, because I don't have to worry about transfers or contaminating equipment if it's uh, a separate fermenter that is also the serving device, so that's been really nice. I also picked up a counterflow wort chiller, the Exchillerator. Um, this one, I didn't do any reviews on or anything like that, I just bought it for myself. But really, I wanted to get a counterflow chiller because I think it works really well considering that I throw my hops directly into the boil every single time instead of using a hop spider. Um, I could still use the plate chiller for that, but a counterflow chiller is just infinitely easier to clean, and I can guarantee I'm not gonna have any clogs in the chiller because it's just an open pipe. I um, mean, that's been working really, really well, so I'm gonna continue using it, even if it is a little bit bulky. And then one of my favorite things that I got this year, uh, or really I built, not really acquired, uh, was the beer engine, the, the hand pump, pneumatic pump that I used for my cask brew, uh, the cask English uh, bitter that I made, which was a very close, I think number four for my favorite beers of this year. Uh, that experience was so much fun, being able to hand pump out of uh, out of a legitimate cask, essentially, uh, this fresh beer was just so awesome. That hand pump's still in the basement. I'm going to continue making beers for it, but we'll talk more about that later. I also picked up a handful of like mini kegs and uh, pressurized growlers and stuff like that. You've seen the the pressurized growler quite recently, in fact. And lastly, I had the pinter sent to me, um, which was a rather divisive video, apparently. Um, I thought it was a really interesting system. It seems to have upset a ton of people that I backed such a product. But bottom line, I thought it was an innovative system, and I thought it was a really, really creative way to get people into brewing. And in my book, if you're getting people into brewing, that's one of the most important things. I still stand by everything I said in that video, and I acknowledge that it's not the normal thing for me to do, but uh, at the end of the day, like I said, what's most important, I think, about that product is that it is getting people into the hobby, and that is worth a lot. And lastly, I got a lot of extra auxiliary production equipment. So number one, this voiceover microphone, which I've been using right now, the Blue Yeti, has been fantastic. I really think that's made a huge improvement in the audio quality of my videos um, and in various places. But for where I can't use a microphone that has to be constantly tethered to a computer, I also got the DJI wireless microphones and those have been awesome as well. And uh, that's been providing the majority of the audio for most of the year. This is a relatively new pickup. I also ended up picking up a 50 millimeter macro lens, which has been awesome for just getting in really close to things like kernels of, of grain and hops. I really, really like macro filming, um, and I think it really brings out a lot of detail into some of the recipe ingredients, so that's been a pretty cool upgrade. And adding to that, of course, I have this external monitor now, uh, which allows me to really dial in my exposure, my colors, all of those good and important things, so I don't screw up too much more video. And um, got a camera cage as well to really help with things and a new tripod. A lot of auxiliary stuff um, that's re really been very, very useful and has ultimately, I think, made a 
a measurable impact in the production quality for the for the channel. Now let's talk about some notable events that happened for the year. First and foremost, I have a daughter um, that was born October 27th of this year. She is an incredible blessing and somebody that I just am so happy to share this life with. I also can't wait to uh, to have her help now with the brew days and stuff like that, but. Um, Words cannot express just how amazing it is to be a first time dad. I'm still very happy to be able to work on the channel despite having a newborn. My wife is incredibly supportive, uh, but my family is the single most important thing to me. And uh, it is so awesome that my family has grown this year. And um, and yeah, it's uh, that's, that's the big one for this year. I was also able to do another round of NHC submissions, National Homebrew Competition submissions, uh, and this year did not come back with any medals like I did last year, but I did have a first round win in two uh, categories. Uh, so I had the mini best of show silver for my robust porter that I mentioned earlier, but the Irish red ale that I also made around the same time of year came back with a mini best of show bronze for that category as well. So um, that was pretty cool to see and uh, still very, very enjoyable uh, to have that NHC experience. This year, I think, was a lot more competitive than the year prior, um, and there's a lot better feedback that came back from the judges this year, too. So it was a very good experience and something I still intend to do next year. And then kind of adjacent to that, I also was able to go to Homebrew Con uh, this year in San Diego, which was an awesome experience because just for a million reasons, just being able to meet up with the other brew tubers that I hung out with there, Portly Gentleman, The Brew Show, uh, Mean Brews, just being able to see these guys, spend some time with them, pick their brains and just be, you know, people. Uh, together and just having a great time. I was able to meet so many of you guys, which was super awesome. Uh, lots of people came up to me and uh, shared a word with me, had a beer with me, and uh, just was an awesome, awesome experience getting to meet so many of you uh, and just to have good conversation. I was able to meet awesome homebrew heroes like John Palmer, Drew Beecham, and Denny Khan, guys like that. Just, uh, they're super down to earth, they're super awesome. You know, also there was just a tremendous amount of educational content there, just great speakers, great seminars. Uh, uh, and there's tons and tons of amazing beer to drink. Uh, it was a great experience and one that I really hope I can do again. Not only did I travel to San Diego, but I also traveled to Norway. One of the very first things I did this year was an awesome trip to Norway where I was able to participate in a brew with a homebrew club there in Lillehammer. I really enjoyed my travel to Norway. It's a tremendous homebrewing culture there um, and just a really, really interesting country with great people. I also spent some time in Portland, Maine for my buddy's bachelor party and uh, was able to explore something like 15 different breweries there. It's one of the, the best places to go craft beer hunting. It's a fantastic beer city and one that's uh, often overlooked in terms of the bigger places, but uh, man, it is, it is worth the trip. Uh, and then lastly, I also went to Belgium again. Because I've already made one video on traveling to Belgium, I decided not to make any more content on it, but I still had a great time and obviously still drank a ton of fantastic Belgian beers. And also in terms of notable events, I think this is worth mentioning. I brewed my first sour beers. Uh, so I, as I said earlier, don't really tend to gravitate towards sour beers all that much. Um, they're not really the best thing for my palate, but I still had a lot of fun making them. I made a Goza with Philly Sour. Um, that was pretty good. And then I made that raspberry uh, kettle soured Berliner Weiss. And, and yes, while I wasn't the world's biggest fan of these beers, they still were a great learning experience. And uh, it kind of in, it showed me that sour beer doesn't need to be difficult to make. Being able to build experience with souring techniques like kettle souring is certainly a good thing for me as well. Collaborations increased this year. I said I wanted to do more collabs and I did. So first of all, I did a podcast, the Double Hop Beat podcast. Uh, they do a great one. Uh, I do recommend checking them out on Spotify or any other service, uh, and you can find our episode where we talked about a little bit of everything. Uh, just had a great conversation and uh, really enjoyed that podcast. I did a home brewery tour collab with Pierre from Simple Homebrew, so that was a lot of fun. It kind of got to show off the more finished state that my basement home brewery has gotten to since I last uh, shot some content around it. I also partnered with Martin Keane from The Brewlosophy Show, and I did a triangle taste test of beers that he produced for a experiment surrounding uh, the concept behind one of my more popular videos, which was uh, ditching the hop spider and throwing hops directly into the kettle. I was very happy to have 
identified correctly the odd beer out and noticing a difference between the two types of beers, even though they were relatively lightly hopped pale lagers. I had a really great time partnering with Martin. Uh, we actually talked a ton on the outside of that video about some other stuff. So hopefully Martin and I will be working together again soon for something else. And then last but certainly not least, partner with Trent at The Brew Show while I was at Homebrew Con to film a graph tasting video. We did an experimental graph brew, which is a blend of apple juice and beer wort, basically, that's co-fermented. Instead of making any old graph the way we wanted to do it, though, Trent had the really, really fun idea of getting a random Wheel of Fortune, essentially, for a random base style, which could have been almost anything, uh, to brew the graph bit with. And uh, man, we had a great time with that. I ended up getting Old Ale, he ended up getting Brute IPA, and um, the, the collaboration was just tons of fun. And it was also just awesome to meet him and hang out with him and uh, do all of HomebrewCon with him, too. So it was just super fun great guy and um, I really hope that we can collaborate again. But now it's time to talk about plans for next year. Um, I have a lot of different things planned, but next year's definitely gonna be different because I have a kid, right? So I'm gonna try and brew as much as I can, but don't be surprised if I'm not able to produce as much brewing content as I used to be able to. Taking care of my family, as I said before, is my number one priority, as it should be. There might be a decrease in content frequency because of that, but I still intend on making some, some fun stuff. Um, so first and foremost, though, I want to try and shift focus a little bit on some more beginner friendly content as well. There's still plenty of advanced brews that I have planned for 2024, uh, but I do want to have uh, some dedicated content that's more focused on beginners. The reason for this is I think I'm starting to observe a little bit more interest increasing in home brewing. Um, I don't think the hobby's dead. It is declining, yes, but we're also looking at data from 2020 and 2021 where there was an enormous spike in home brewing. And we're kind of getting to that point where all those people who got into it really briefly got out of it. And I think at this point we're kind of back to relatively normal, but there's still plenty of people that are getting into home brewing every single day. So I want to make sure that I can create some more friendly content for them and help to uh, make it more accessible for everybody as well. Many of you have also seen the post for this, but I've taken some time, like a lot of time recently to manually build pretty much all of my recipes that I've published into Brewfather. Um, I did not do every single beer I have in my channel because not every single one is really worth keeping in Brewfather, but as of today, I have 94 recipes on Brewfather right now, and they're all linked to the video that I made for that particular beer and back and forth, vice versa. I think Brewfather is the best platform to do this with because it's a very, very easy thing for people to use. Um, the UI is fantastic. You can use it entirely from your phone even if you want to, but you can copy and save recipes very easily. You can share recipes very easily. You can scale them and adjust your own equipment very, very easily. Um, and I think that's gonna make the uh, recipes that I put out on YouTube a lot easier to use uh, as opposed to just copying down all of the info from the description box. So moving forward, all of my recipes will continue to get added into Brewfather, and I think people are going to hopefully get a lot out of that. Um, I'm starting to really come around onto that software. It's, uh, it's a really powerful thing. So this year, I did a dry January, and it was a really beneficial experience. I felt healthier, I lost a little bit of weight, and I was actually able to kind of recalibrate my relationship with alcohol, uh, which is always kind of a little bit of a touchy thing. Um, I think there's benefit in having a healthy relationship with alcohol, but don't be afraid to give it a little bit of distance every so often. So this year, I will be doing another dry January, especially after the holidays, I think, uh, where most of us are probably adults a bit more than usual. Having a dry January is just a great way to reset and uh, just a, a nice healthy thing to do. And to support that and building off of a lot of things that I learned at HomebrewCon this year, I really want to dive into some non-alcoholic brews. I'm really confident about this one recipe I've developed. I think it's going to be flavorful. I really really want to figure out how to make non-alcoholic beer actually taste like beer. <laughs> Most people can tell the difference right away, but I had a few at HomebrewCon where I could not tell the difference. Um, so I really do want to, uh, to dive into that subject. I think the interest in non-alcoholic brewing is growing exponentially as well. So it should be interesting to see what the response is to that. I think that's going to be a great way, though, to stay engaged in the brewing habits during dry January. Of course, once dry January is over, it's back to, you know, regular alcoholic brewing. I have a lot of plans. I have a long backlog of recipes that I really want to try. But number one, I want to do a lot more English beers, especially now that I have that hand pump. I've said this before, 
a couple years ago, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna focus on English beers this year, and then I never did because I just got distracted by things. But man, I they're so good, and they're a very underexplored uh, niche of brewing that I really want to do a little bit more with. Having been to the UK, having a rather large contingent of viewers from the UK, I've gotten a lot of good advice on how to make English, Irish, and Scottish beers um, much more authentically. And so I've got a couple plans for a couple different brews lined up uh, for English beers next year, and I think it's gonna be a lot of fun, especially if I can serve them off of that hand pump. In the same vein, my double decoction mash Czech Dark Lager that I did almost entirely traditionally, entirely the hard way, was my number one beer for the year. My absolute favorite, and I really had a ton of fun making it. I wanna do something similar with some other Czech lagers, so expect more Czech beer content. And lastly, I really have enjoyed doing collaborations with other YouTubers, so I really hope to keep that going. Might be a bit harder to fit it in with the kid now, but um, still do the best we can to get some, some good collaboration going. And that's gonna wrap it up for our year in review. Um, I really am excited for 2024. This channel is not slowing down, and I am incredibly, incredibly grateful to all of you who watch on the regular, who show your support, who give me ideas, and just uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments and all that. Just It's a wonderful community that we are a part of here. The homebrewing community is alive and well, especially on YouTube. So please continue keeping it up. Let me know if you want to see something in particular next year down in the comments below, and I'll see if we can work on it. And so from the bottom of my heart, from my family to yours, I wish you a blessed holiday season and a very happy new year. And so I will see you all in 2024. And until then, cheers and happy brewing.